G'day everyone, this is Greg Roy and welcome to episode 30 of Rare and Resilient 1 in 5000 podcast where we're talking IAARM and today we are joined by Christina from Washington State in America who is the mother of Eliza who is nearly three and a half years old and her story is story number 29 on page 56 of the book. G'day Christina and welcome to the podcast. Hi, happy to be here. Great to speak to you and for you to be able to share Eliza's story. Yes, of course. This is going to be Eliza's story. She is, like you said, three years old now, but this is going to be from the beginning. Everything leading up to the birth of Eliza seemed normal. Nothing out of the ordinary on ultrasounds. My labor was normal. And after 12 hours of contractions, Eliza was born on December 7th, 2018. The nurse did her checklist and I did mine. She had 10 fingers and 10 toes. She was breathing and she was healthy. I held her for a long time and stared into her eyes. She was perfect to me. We were moved to our overnight room and everything still felt okay. I knew that you were supposed to keep them in their own bed, but I've always been extra protective and I immediately moved her to my own bed. She was such a good baby that first night. She slept most of the time and I changed every diaper. I started to notice, however, every time I tried to feed her, she was immediately spitting up. When I mentioned that to my nurses, though, they said it was normal. It would take time for her to eat, but to me, it just didn't seem normal. I mentioned it again, still receiving the same answer. The next day, a pediatrician came in to check her out, and he said everything looked normal, giving us the okay to leave. I immediately thought it was weird because she hadn't pooped yet, and I remember with my son that they waited for him to poop before they let us leave. I mentioned this to the nurse and she said she had told me that Eliza had indeed already pooped, but I knew this wasn't true because I had had her all night. While the overnight nurse had written that she had, I made it very clear that she had not. Between her spitting up and her not pooping, I knew something was wrong. A nurse talked to the pediatrician and he recommended an enema. The nurses then came in with supplies to do the enema only to discover Eliza did not have an anus. They seemed surprised by this and immediately looked at me and said, there is no hole. I asked, what does that mean? I had never even thought such a thing was possible. Immediately, Eliza was being wheeled down to the NICU and I couldn't even begin to grasp what was going on. All I remember is our pediatric surgeon telling us that Eliza was full of stool. She had no anus and needed emergency surgery. I was crying and my husband was crying, but we agreed to get her into surgery immediately. The surgeon told us she had imperforate anus. It would require a series of surgeries and recovery. I was so shocked and tired that I could not comprehend what it all meant. Two hours later, Eliza was out of surgery, hooked up to every tube and wire you could think of. It broke my heart to see her like that. The fact that I couldn't hold her made it even worse. Immediately, we noticed her stoma, which was where her stool would come out. Since she had no anus, she would need a colostomy bag. We stayed a week in NICU and learned the proper care for her and how to change the colostomy bag. I remember crying a lot, mostly because of the uncertainty facing us and the fact that I had little knowledge about her condition. No one had ever warned me this might happen, and I felt so lost and alone. Once we mastered the care of her colostomy bag and her stoma, we were able to go home. This was such a relief. Once home, we were able to start the healing process. But the moment we arrived, I started to feel anxious. No longer did we have the help of nurses or care of the NICU. We were all alone. The colostomy bag seemed to be a bigger problem than we thought. My husband worked night shifts, so most nights I was alone to get up and care for Eliza. This seemed to be the time that her colostomy bag wanted to leak and needed to be changed. It was possible to do with only one person, but was easier with two. Trying to gather all the supplies and get the bag on before she would poop again was really hard. Many times it would take me 45 minutes to an hour to get it on, and by that time, Eliza and I were both tired. Besides the frustration of getting the bag to stay on, she was doing great. She was a baby with regular baby problems, but just with the added complication of a colostomy bag. I didn't tell many people what was going on with her because I wanted to leave it up to her, as she grew older, who she would tell and how much. It was always a little awkward when someone would ask to hold her and they could feel her bag. I would tell them kind of what was going on with her when she was born, but then leave it at that. 
When she was three months old, she had her PSAR surgery. This is when they created her anus, and it was a big surgery, which took a few hours. When Eliza came out of surgery, she was very swollen and in and out of sleep for 12 hours. It seemed like she was in pain, but besides giving her pain medication, all we could do was hold her. Luckily, after a day, she started feeling better, and we were able to go home and start our second part of her healing process. We also started dilations at this time. Dilators were sticks made to help stretch the anus to prepare for poop. It seemed pretty invasive and scary at first, but over time, she barely seemed to notice I was doing it. When she was six months old, she had her colostomy closure. This surgery, what they would say, the big one. They told us her pain levels could be high and that the recovery could sometimes be rough. I felt so much stress and anxiety, I barely slept the week leading up to it. After her surgery, she seemed to be doing okay. She had a fever, which went down after a few hours, but we weren't allowed to leave until she pooped. We also had cream and powder that we had to apply generously on her butt. This was to help with the rash that they said would occur since her skin was not used to having poop on it. On the second day in the hospital, she finally pooped. Just a little bit of poop, but there was poop. Never in a million years did I think I would cry over poop. It was such a strange experience. I felt the weight of months of worry carried on my shoulders start to lift. I felt like I could finally see the light at the end of the tunnel for her. I could start to see the future, although a lot of work still needed to be done. Making sure she was pooping enough and she didn't have the rash felt like a full-time job. But straight up, I noticed she was not pooping a lot at all. We had just started her on baby food and stayed away from the things that could make her constipated. Our doctor recommended pear or prune juice. That seemed to work for a bit, but then she started getting backed up again. After numerous doctor's appointments, we finally agreed to use Miralax and enemas to get her all cleared out. Because she was staying so backed up, we did this every day, as well as going to the doctor weekly to get x-rays done. Finally, after a couple of months, we got her cleared out. Our next step was to put her on Senna. We gave her the chocolate squares, and they worked great. Enemas were needed from time to time, and we still had to give her Miralax too. When she was 20 months old, she went into surgery for three hernias on her belly button and above. This was a quick surgery, and she was still able to go home the same day. Throughout this whole process, I have learned how strong Eliza is. The amount of pain and procedures she has endured in her first two years of life is just crazy. She is such a happy girl, though. Every time we think something is going to hold her back, she surprises us with her strength and perseverance. I think this will leave a bigger mental scar on me and her father than it will on her. She knows her doctors well and always excited to see them. Even when she's in pain, she seems to smile and laugh. That usually makes it easier on us when most of the time I feel helpless or like there is more I should be doing. When we first got her diagnosis of a perforate anus, we had no idea what it was was or how to deal with it. I had never heard of anyone ever having it and I felt so alone. Even when people would ask what was wrong, I didn't know how exactly to describe it. I didn't want to get the facts wrong or share too much of Eliza's personal story. I felt myself going back and forth between wanting to shed light on something that happens to one in 5,000 babies and letting Eliza have her privacy. This happens a lot more than is talked about and it's time to raise more awareness. I want to help new parents who hear this diagnosis and feel doomed. I don't think I would have managed as well if I didn't find the IA page on Facebook. This page helped us through our journey so much, and I finally felt like I had people to talk to that understood what we were going through. A community that understands crying over a leaking colostomy bag or our kids' first poop. Eliza isn't even two yet, so I know we still have a lot to learn. As life continues, I'm so glad we have the support of the IA community and her amazing doctors. We will continue to work to make sure she can achieve anything she wants in life and to wear her diagnosis as a badge of strength and honor. Oh, Christina, that's such a wonderful story. I know you and I have chatted along the way and I know a bit about Eliza's story. So for you to actually put it in words, it's really great. Yeah. Now, I always ask this to the parents who read their stories back. How do you feel reading it back now? Like it, that was probably 18 months ago when you wrote the story. It starts to bring back all of the memories of feeling almost not seeing the end where it would start to get better and I know hearing from other parents they say it'll get better you'll get better you know you'll you'll learn and you'll come to terms with everything and back then it just seemed like such a looming thing that I didn't understand and so many things were going on that it was overwhelming but now I can look back and I feel like I'm that seasoned parent that can tell people like hey you'll you'll get it you'll get there (laughs) 
Yeah, and that's so valuable because it really is a day-to-day. You just live in the moment, don't you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, I mean, she's only, you know, three years old, so we have so much more of her journey to live through. So we're, we're learning day by day. I want to take you back to the start where the doctors and the nurses missed the diagnosis. Did they ever apologize or come to you afterwards, you and your husband, to uh, explain what had happened, how they misdiagnosed? No, no, honestly, we we thought about going and taking it further and complaining and all that, but we were just so overwhelmed by everything that was going on that we didn't take it that far, but it, it uh, really shed light on us to tell every parent around us to be aware of things like that, that we weren't, we had no idea. And talking to other doctors and nurses after the fact, they told us that they, they should have checked for those things and they didn't. So that's kind of, kind of sad. Yeah. Unfortunately, as you know, by reading the book and hearing the stories, that's not an isolated case. So the more we promote IA, ARM out into the medical community, it just has to happen that each time a child is born that it gets checked because we yes. can't keep having this happen. Exactly. Now you mentioned how in your story that you've gone from wanting to protect Eliza's privacy to wanting to create awareness. How has that shaped how you've been thinking and how you ended up sharing your story to start with? I think in the beginning I was I was more worried about how she would take it, the whole situation. And I wanted her to be able to, to deal with that herself and not just kind of put every, all of her business out there. As time has gone on, I've realized that she is strong and I, I already feel it in her, in her spirit that she would want to advocate for things like this. So I feel like if I advocate for her, she will have the strength to advocate for herself. So I think I kind of did a turn where I was like, if I feel comfortable and I can come out and say, this is something that we need to talk about, then she will look at me and say that the same thing, you know, we, we, we need to talk about this and she will, she'll, she'll sure for surely be that person. I I can feel it. She's got a strong spirit. (laughs) Yeah. Well, she's been through a lot. How is she going at the moment? How is her bowel management? So right now we're doing the same thing. We have the uh, Miralax and Xlax right now that we're doing. We're working on potty training. So I think as we work through the potty training stage, we might discover, you know, issues that we don't have with diapers, obviously. I know that she's aware that something is a little off. She, you know, even we went on a trip and I think she she knows that she's a little bit different than others. She can kind of tell. So just openly talking to her about it, letting her know that it's okay. You know, she knows that she has, she calls it her, her belly issues at this point at three. So, you know, I think when she gets to school age, where she starts going to school, we're going to obviously have a different kind of bowel management than we do now at three, where she's home and doesn't have to really worry when she goes or how she goes. The enemas, have they continued or it's just more just taking the Mirrorlax and the Xlax? We haven't done enemas in over a year, I feel like now. So she's been pretty normal, which is the Miralax and the Xlax. But I think the issue that we're going to have is making her regular. So she goes at, you know, a, a good time that won't affect her everyday life yep. in the future. So in regard to the potty training, do you think she's understanding when she needs to go, et cetera? Or do you think she's still a bit too young yet? I, she knows when she needs to go and she will let me know. Uh, she will go on the toilet, but sometimes I think she gets a little stressed about being on the toilet. So she'll ask to be put back in her diaper. So she's kind of at that stage. If we're out in public, she'll ask to go to the toilet. She doesn't like to go like in her diaper, um, which I feel like it, it's hard to tell what's normal toddler behavior compared yes. to like what, you know, what is her condition and stuff like that but she does she does know when she needs to go for sure yeah that's a real yes. positive you said she's got an older brother how has he dealt with it all luckily there's a gap of 11 years so he's oh, okay. 14 right now um so he he can grasp and he can understand how serious it can be sometimes especially when we go on trips and i say hey she's just having one of her days she's gonna have issues today 
he's really understanding and he knows that she she needs that extra space and stuff like that. So he's really, really good about it. Oh, that's good. At the moment, with going to see the doctor, what's the regular? You're on a 12-month appointment? We are about six months now. There was a time that we were going every month, but we've kind of gotten her to a spot where we both feel comfortable that unless something drastically changes, she can go every six months, which is working. And then they do the x-ray and she's usually okay. Everything comes out okay. Right. So was she born in with any other associated issues other than the IA? Nope. They checked her for everything else and she just had IA. That was the only issue. Right. So how have you dealt with it all? I know you mentioned in there that you said that you and your husband probably have more longer term issues dealing with the emotions of it all. Do you want to just talk yes. about how you've dealt with it? I would say in the beginning, obviously it was very stressful and rough and just watching your child go through any kind of pain or feeling almost helpless, like you don't have the answers to help them is the really hard part because you want to be able to make them comfortable and make them happy. So for us, it was just hard to watch her go through the surgeries, be in that pain, or when she has a really bad day where she's backed up and she's in pain and feeling like maybe there's something we could have done better, or if we knew something better, we could, you know, help her out more. Just that overall feeling of what can we do to make this better kind of thing is what gets to us the most, because obviously you don't ever want to see your child in pain. And if I could take this away from her. And mostly worrying about like her future and stuff, what where this is going to take her and stuff and how she's going to deal with it in, in life is always things that come up in my brain. Did you get help yourself initially to help you through all this or you just dealt no, with it I, yourself? No, I didn't. No, <laughs> just family and friends that were there to help me talk through it and kind of, you know, direct me in the direction that I needed to be and say, you know, you're strong. You're going to make a strong kid. And if you're there for her, she'll always understand that you, your love and support is enough. What you're doing is enough. Yeah. And how about your husband? How has he dealt with it all? Because it's sort of like the mum takes a lot of all the burden. Yeah. yeah. He actually did better than me in the beginning. Um, he got a lot of compliments in the NICU. A lot of nurses saying that how hands-on he was. He, he knew how to do the colostomy bag before I did. He had to show me how to do it. Um, I think I just mentally checked out and was very overwhelmed. Obviously, I just gave birth. And so yeah. he saw that in me and he took over and he made sure that he learned and got it all done. So by the time we got home, he was showing me how to do everything that the nurses were showing us because I would say like, oh, I know they showed me, but I don't remember how to do any of this. He, he remembered and he, 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 even when the bag would le leak, he would learn how to like make it not leak and find new ways to do it. If I can't make it to a doctor's appointment, he's the one taking her and he's always the one. He knows all of her problems and advocating for her just as much as I am, if not more. Oh, that's so wonderful. It yeah. really is a team effort, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, when one of us is just having a hard day, the other one steps in especially when we were doing, you know, enemas like twice a day, it, it was rough. So we were the, our support team, you know, really need that. And you mentioned how the support groups helped you. Do you want to just talk about that in a little bit more detail? Yeah. So when it happened, when we found out, I felt really alone. Like this was only happening to us. Even if I talked to like close family members, nobody had heard of it. And I felt like there was no one for me to talk to about it because no one understood. And then one day I just decided to go on Facebook and search, you know, perforated anus and see what came up. And I came up with the group. I joined it and I started reading through stories and I was like, wow, these people understand what I'm going through. They get it. Like they get the colostomy bag, they get the processes, the surgeries. And then I felt a little bit better because I was like, I'm not alone. We're not alone in this. And I could see kids living past the age that my daughter was and, you know, living a good life and having a life. And I felt, you know, really encouraged by that. And do you still find comfort in reading some of the stories like from the teens or the adults, or does it get a bit scary for you sometimes? I, I find comfort in it. I know that there are the scary moments and I know that there will be rough moments, but I love 
I love reading everybody's stories and how they make it through and what they do. I love all that. It helps so much. And how'd you go reading the book, reading all the stories in the book? Did you get through them all? Uh, uh, it's hard to read all of them. I get so emotional. So I, <laughs> I read some at a time, you know, because yes. everybody's story, it, it's, you know, similar, but different. So you just, it's just like hearing everybody's story of how they kind of go through the same thing but in their own way is just so interesting to me. I love it. Depending on where you're born, the similarities are there, aren't they? But the services that the medical services have provided and the support networks, it, it can vary from so many different places. Yeah, so different. But, you know, just the similarities are still there, which, and I mean, you know, emotionally, I feel like we all feel the same, you know, just that dread in the beginning and then you know, you start to, to learn and you start to feel a little bit better and stuff. So I love that. Oh, that's great. So at the moment, you're in that stage where you've had the surgeries, you're in the process of the potty training. So I suppose the next step is to when she gets to the school level. How are you feeling about that? I think that's when we will start to see the real changes when she, I would say she starts to see the changes and how she's a little different from the kids around her. And so I feel like that will be a whole new journey on its own. You know, we're not in this grace period anymore where she's just being potty trained. She has nothing to worry about because she's at home. And so I think it'll it'll be a lot different, a start of a new journey almost <laughs> for yeah, us. Yeah, it goes in stages, our lives. Exactly. So I, we're, we're ready for that stage, but also, you know, we don't know how that stage is going to go. So there's always the nerves around it. Just like before surgery, like they always say, you know, it, it should be good, fine, but you know, there's always a chance and you're like, okay, the nerves, but uh, no, whatever I'm... happens, we'll be there. You know, if, if she has to come home and we got a homeschooler, you know, we'll do it. <laughs> no, well, no biggie. Well, she's got such a wonderful parent. So I know what I'll have, whatever happens, She'll adjust and have your support. That's the most important thing. I always love asking this question. What would be your advice to a mum that's just given birth to a little IA girl or boy and starting off their journey? What would you say to Christina two, three years ago? I think I would say, one, to not feel so alone and feel like you have to do this alone. Rely on people around you. Let them help you. In the beginning, I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to trust, you know, family members to deal with things like a colostomy bag or caring for her with, you know, all of that going on. But I had to let go of that fear and that control of and letting people help me and be there for me and just kind of opening up and saying how I feel and what's going on with me and, and admitting that, uh, yeah, it is hard. It's really hard taking care of a kid that has special needs. So don't don't isolate yourself. And then the other thing is, yeah, really go into the community, find the people that are like you that are dealing with stuff that you're dealing with and open up to them and they will help you. So yeah, just mostly just don't feel like you're alone. You're not alone. <laughs> no, no, that's really great advice. Is there any, anything else you'd like to address, Christina, that we haven't covered in our chat so far? I think bringing the overall awareness to the issue, um, the fact that this happens to one in 5,000 babies and it's still so unknown and not heard of is, is crazy to me because we are, why aren't we talking about this? Why isn't this you know, known by nurses and doctors and medical fields and parents and everybody around? Why isn't this talked about like every other thing that could come up when you have a baby? It's just crazy and just spreading that awareness so we can, we can help parents that feel like, what is going on? I have never heard of this, you know, and that feeling. You're definitely preaching to the converted here. <laughs> <laughs> which you're doing a great job helping with that. I mean, I really latched on to everything that you had to say in the beginning. And it was great to meet someone that kind of lived their life through it. And I mean, you lived in a time that it was really just not a thing at all. So just to hear that it is getting better, but yes. you know, hopefully faster. <laughs> we start working on it faster. And that's why we do what we do to make life easier for beautiful little girls like Eliza and little boys around the world so they don't have to live in secret or feel shame 
like I felt and other yeah. adults around my age that, you know, it was such a taboo subject. Exactly. So, Christina, thank you so much for sharing yours and Eliza's story. It's been really good. And I know it's going to have impact on any parents that listen to it. And I'm sure it's going to resonate with them. So please give Eliza a big hug from me. And, and it's been wonderful having you on. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Thanks, Christina. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.